Fund Supermart, your online gateway to unit trusts. We're here on stage because uh, we've come um, to our panel discussion. So I got to invite our speakers from this morning as well. So let me uh, invite Diana, uh, Carol and Salvin back from our Free Fund House Partners as well as uh, Terence from our Fixed Income team. And uh, it's also time for me to introduce uh, Keen, Keen Chan, who's our senior analyst uh, in our IFA Singapore team. He'll be the moderator for this panel discussion. Uh, so let's get all of them on stage. Okay, I'll leave you in the very good hands of Keen. He's our uh, investment, uh, Opa Winfrey. <laughs> Thanks, JP. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, uh, we will open the panel discussion straight away to the floor. So for those of you who have uh, burning questions to ask the panel, whether it's regarding their presentations or their area of expertise or product-related things, you can step onto the front. There are mics placed in the middle of the aisle for you to ask the panel straight away. So please, if anyone wants to ask, uh, feel free to ask the whole panel or individually if you desire to. Yes, sir. Yes, good afternoon, sir. So far, I've heard a lot of things about the crisis here since the past 10 years. Uh, I'd like to know more about this uh, US debt crisis that might be erupt in the near future. I think Americans for the last 40 50 years, 45 years of like time is running an annual deficit. So by end of fourth quarter 2016, it has about 19 trillion of debts. So this is a very enormous uh, amount of debt. And we trigger another something like what we have seen, a uh, euro crisis like Greece. Maybe you'd like to comment on that? Uh, thank you for the question. I think um, it, at the beginning of my presentation, if you record, um, I spoke about what our investment professionals at Allianz Global Investors thought were the f biggest risks for capital markets. And you saw that, uh, if you recall, 24% thought that a US recession was one of the biggest risks for capital markets. And this is maybe in line with um, what you're saying, that US, although things look brighter, they are still they still have some problems to overcome. Um, and I think for us, uh, we are quite cognizant of that, even though things are starting to turn more positive. And we do think that potentially in the second half that we could see that Trump's policies and the enthusiasm may disappoint the markets. And because of this, you know, for our positioning, we're always much uh, more tactical and we have that in mind. And be also because of this, I believe that potentially... Um, the US dollar could reach a p consolidation or a peak at some point this year. Um, and, you know, we need to think about that in terms of positioning for our funds. I don't know, anyone else? Uh, I think the only thing I will say is um, the debt to GDP, it's an um, uh, indicator that a lot of people look at. I mean, if you look at China, it's also about 260% to debt to GDP. Um, in the case of U.S., I think uh, Trump's policies are pro-growth. Uh, and Probably we will have to face some kind of a fiscal cliff again. Um, so there is a good chance that it goes through Congress um, and gets tabled out in the House. Um, but we are not too worried about the U.S. Uh, we think the U.S. is in very good footing. Um, in fact, we think growth is quite sustainable in the U.S., um, so uh, I think I wouldn't worry too much. And also please remember that uh, US currency is an international currency. So they can always go back to their QE, uh, print currencies, um, print money, and then try to solve their problems. I think, I think the US has the luxury of that. Um, for, for us, we agree um, that, you know, um, basically when you look at debt to GDP, uh, it's not a single indicator to state that you, the country will get into a debt crisis. Um, if you look back in the past history, um, and, and there were studies done, uh, it, it takes a various number of indicators and situations for a country to get into a debt crisis. Um, so 
you know, for the US being the biggest uh, issuer of debt uh, and the fact that the US dollar is a reserve currency, uh, they by themselves actually also do run a current account deficit. Uh, it is two sides of the same coin. Uh, if you are a reserve currency, you will definitely have current account deficits. But that's current account deficits. Um, coming back to fiscal deficits, uh, we, uh, at Brandywine, White, we don't think that it will go uh, into that. Uh, as you can see, uh, 08, they already deleveraged. They releveraged, but it's not as high uh, as it used to be. Um, the, the risk of recession, obviously, is out there. Um, I think it's a very controversial thing that everybody's talking about. Some people say four years, well, no, maybe two years. Uh, no one can tell. Uh, but as it is, uh, it's, it's true that you know Trump's uh, policies are a structural change to uh, U.S. growth. Um, so we'll probably see a, a bit more growth coming out of U.S. if uh, what we call animal spirits is released. Hi. Um, I just uh, this year we're actually entering into the 30th anniversary of Black Monday, uh, and I think that every year that actually ends with seven seems to be uh, some ominous 1987, 1997, uh, 2000, maybe short of a year at 2008. I'm just wondering in your fund managers uh, when you survey the landscape, what are the potential uh, potential things that could possibly happen uh, in that kind of scale for maybe this year and possibly next year? Um, I, I'll state one or two things which I'm pretty scared about this year. Um, I think a trade war cannot be ruled out uh, and it can be quite nasty and quite scary, I think. Um, I think we've already started to see some rhetoric uh, from Trump's camp, but I think something that China did a few weeks ago that missed media's attention, they put tariffs on US agriculture. So I think China's already started firing its first salvo, even before the US fires. Um, also remember the big backdrop is that we are facing two very strong leaders in the world. Uh, Xi Jinping after the 19th National Congress in November this year, is going to be even more powerful than he already is. And Trump is a strong head. So we are going to have a big mudslinging between US and China, and the smaller countries are going to pay the price for it. So that, that's the biggest worst case scenario I, I'm worried about. Markets crashing, I'm not too sure. I think there's a lot of standby um, facilities out there to inject liquidity as and when there's a, some stress. The Fed could go, oh, we're not going to hike rates um, and we're just going to watch uh, if there's volatility. So I'm not too worried about liquidity constraints or liquidity crisis. I'm more worried about trade wars. Um, and um, I, I think that that's going to probably unravel. And I think a lot of people have no imagination or no clue how ugly things can actually turn out to be. Um, for us, we um, are looking closely at geopolitical risks. Uh, coming back again to trade war, that is right. Uh, that is one of the top things, uh, risks out there um, that we are facing. Um, in addition to Xi Jinping and and um, Trump, you also have Putin, and in Russia, right? So you've got very three very strong, uh, almost um, very strong leaders out there uh, with their own ideas about what they want to do. Um, the other thing that we uh, are also worried about, uh, obviously, is China. Um, their currency, will it continue to depreciate or is it going to be a one-off devaluation? If it's a one-off devaluation, if we remember back to 2015 August, it really sent the markets into a tailspin. And it's just China doing that. So um, we, we all have to be prepared. Um, I think capital outflows continue. Uh, you can tell just by looking at the reserve numbers uh, every month. Um, so the, the outlook, it seems, is that, is that there will be continued depreciation, but one-off devaluation, we're not too sure. Uh, they are you know, holding on capital controls very tight, and that is also a sign that they're getting actually very worried. So the more capital controls they do, the more worried we get. Uh, and I think the other, in the other part of the world is Europe, um, for this year, I think we need to really watch for the potential for further 
um, you know, with the, with the presidential elections coming up in Germany and France, that the potential for a Eurozone breakup, I think that would be very, very significant. Um, at this point, it's, I, you know, it's, it's not our base case scenario that this would happen, but neither was Brexit, and that happened. So this is something that we need to have at the back of our minds as investors. Uh, in addition to that, um, how the whole Brexit thing plays out. I think that could also um, create opportunities, but also potential risks um, to the markets. Yeah, we have another question, so maybe you can move on. Sure, please. Hi, um, thank you for your, all your presentations. Um, the theme, I think, um, is about, I mean, about reflation and about um, overweighting equities. Um, so I was just wondering if the panel has any, um, has their eye on any particular sectors, for example, maybe healthcare being affected by um, Trump repealing Obamacare, or perhaps if um, the trade wars don't play out, maybe shipping will make a comeback. So I'd just like your views on that. Thanks. I'm not quite sure whether I understood the question. Um, you, you started off with reflation, were you asking? Yeah, basically it's, well, I mean, I, the theme I, I got was about um, overweighting equities and yes. that's moving back towards right. that. So I'm just wondering about right. your views on any yeah. particular sectors um, yeah. that you're interested in. Yeah. The, the starting point is we have ended an era of very loose monetary policies. And the unconventional monetary tools that we saw with QE or negative interest rate policy has, is past us already. That marks the bottom of bond yields. If you look at Brexit, after June's shocking results, bond yields went to 1.35 or 1.25, and it never looked back again. And to us in our minds, that is the end of ultra-loose monetary policies. That's the bottom. And if you think about that, then you can think about the great rotation everybody's talking about. Mm. How fast it rotates, it really depends on money flows and how fast growth comes back or inflation comes back. But we are very clear that we have seen the best of bond returns. But that doesn't mean you're going to lose money on bonds. You're probably going to make your 2-3%, not your 6-7% that you used to make the last 7-8 years. Right? Yeah. But the, the question then is, is this going to reverse? Well, the US is in the 8th year of economic recovery. Don't forget that. Right? So it is not going to go on forever. The good news is Trump is pro-growth, which means that we're going to have one more jab of growth boost, fiscal policies, infrastructure, cutting taxes, and that's going to be good for the US. So which means that this economic cycle could be stretched further, maybe one year, two years, three years. So before Trump came, maybe middle of last year, people were saying 35% chance of US recession. But I think the risk of US recession is a lot reduced now. So if you think about that, and you think about inflation, inflation is good for equities, right? And why is it good? Because companies can price, companies can earn better margins. And our research has shown that when inflation comes back, your PE gets re-rated. So while you think the S&P 500 is 17, 18 times PE, our research shows it can go to 19 times PE, right? Like I think somebody showed a chart earlier where the US looks like top, 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 but it just keeps going up. Uh, and are there any particular sectors in particular for equities that will be Sorry, I'm the equities guy here. So, most uh, beneficial? Uh, I'll, I'll go first and you guys. So I, I think on the equities, I think it's commodities and energy, very clearly. Um, these are inflation plays. And of course, the energy market is looking balanced this year. The supply-demand dynamics are balanced this year. Um, otherwise, I think uh, a whole lot of companies, industrial, consumer, they're all going to benefit. Banks are the biggest beneficiary because as inflation happens, when the bond yields curve steepens and when the Fed hikes rates, then your banks are going to do well. And for those who are not tracking, Deutsche Bank is up 50% in the last three months. Um, Bank of America is also up about 40%. Well, DBS Bank is up 20%. So, right? so banks have done completely very well and they're going to continue doing well. As inflation happens, as the Fed hikes rates, um, and also Trump is saying that all oh, the Dodd-Frank rules and all these heavy regulations in banks have to go, which means the banks could be doing what they used to do before the crisis, right? So it comes one full circle. But these are the sectors we identify as uh, possible beneficiaries. Healthcare is a bit tricky because healthcare has got other issues. 
Yeah. Um, but largely, we think these are the biggest beneficiaries. Uh, and of course, um, some of the low growth dividend yielding companies could probably suffer. Yeah. Thanks very much. Any other questions from the floor? Yeah, sure. Um, perhaps the gentleman at the back first. Thank you for your presentations. Um, I'm glad there's some talk about Trump because uh, he, seems, he seems to be the great disruptor to the global economy. Um, but there hasn't been a lot spoken throughout the morning and afternoon session. So I'd like to hear if he really does what he has said he will do, uh, which a couple of stuff. Um, the good thing is basically economically, it's basically going to be pro-growth for the US. What's the implications to our investments in terms of our of where we should put our dollars. Should we therefore be anti-emerging markets and pro-US, for example? Okay, maybe I'll take that question uh, since uh, I haven't spoken yet. Okay, but for Trump, right, I think Trump might actually be an Asian, uh, to be honest. Uh. He seems to be very good at driving a very hard bargain. You know, when you go to a Pasar Malam or a night market, right, the store auntie will always tell you $500 at first. Then you tell her $50. At the end of the day, you two will converge in the middle, maybe $100, $200, or somewhere in between. Right? But for Trump, he and his extreme policies, from what we've been seeing, right, he started to dial back some of them, from building a wall around Mexico, having Mexico pay for it. Now it seems as if US taxpayers are going to pay for it. Okay, so a lot of these things are political rhetoric. So whether it's, he's really going to be able to enact them okay, is something that we'll all have to wait and see, because right? we don't really know whether he'll be able to. Okay, but I think as a politician, he had to say quite a fair bit of things to be able to get the votes he needed. Okay, he was targeting a lot of the middle class, the lower workers, people that lost their jobs in manufacturing centers in the US and all. Okay, and they really, I think they really um, hated globalization. Because from you know, manufacturing cars in US, in Detroit and all, and it's a lot more expensive than in China right, and, or in Japan, and then you import them across the border from Mexico and all. Then you, know, you have to say quite a fair bit of things to be able to get people to believe in you that you're bringing jobs back. You know, factories and all will start to be built back in the US and so on and so forth. Uh. Okay, so a lot of the things Trump has said might not actually pan out to be true. Uh. Okay, but if they do pan out to be true, right, then I don't think we can all say that, you know, let's go anti-Asia, anti-EM, anti-this, anti-that. Okay, there's always something that we can look for. Okay, so if you think trade wars are going to start breaking out, then don't look so much at global trade, right, at a, maybe a large cap Asia X Japan where a lot of the companies are you know, focus on exports to developed markets, so on and so forth. But why not consider small caps where you're more domestically oriented, right? Yes, a lot of small cap companies that do, are not exposed to the uh, global uh, trade markets, right? Whether they're exporting, exporting to places like US and Europe. You just give an example of a small cap stock in Singapore, maybe a uh, bread talk, for example. We all go to Taifeng. We go to buy our coffees and all from um, their chain of coffee toast box and all. So there are different small caps and all where you don't really get exposed so much to some of the so-called issues or risks that we see out there. So I think small caps could be something that you might like to consider rather than just saying, you know, let's go anti-emerging markets and not buy uh, EM equities. Uh. So maybe EM equities, a lot of them are driven by domestic consumption. India, one of the largest domestic consumption countries in the world. Brazil is up and coming middle class as well, although they were delayed a bit by what happened with Rusev. Okay, and China, even China itself, they're not looking to be the factory of the world anymore. Okay, not at least what we used to know them for, where you know, everything was made in China and all. But now they're looking to rebalance from exports towards domestic consumption. So if you were to go straight away you know, from having Asia X Japan equities inside your portfolio to being anti-Asia or cutting it down to a very small amount, then I think you'd be missing out some of the opportunities and some of the underlying themes that some of these EMs and Asian countries are actually trying to go for. Yeah, so maybe just taking, uh, I mean, we've been talking a lot about all these uh, Trump-related, very macro issues, but I think when you're talking about the US market, so the, the big question is how much of all these positives have already been factored into the market? I mean, uh, value is, uh, you know, it's, it's always there, but uh, it really depends on the price you pay. Okay, so I think that the big theme that we're looking at why we're still favoring EMs, uh, you know, Asia X Japan, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US and some of the developed markets, is really that the market is really just recognizing all that growth potential in the US. Uh, we're talking about PEs, uh, they used to be 15, 16 times, now we're talking about 17, 18, 19. And then in Asia, where, you know, because of certain rebalancing action in China, things have been taking a lot longer. 
You're looking at uh, banks trading you know, near book value, dividend yields 5, 6, 7 percent. Uh, that's still the, the, the order of the day. So there's lots, lots of value to be had in the markets that are actually closer to us, while you know, they, they may not be the main beneficiaries of uh, you know, Trump's uh, uh, pro-US domestic uh, focus policy. Uh, I mean, it's hard to see a situation where the US can survive just by itself in, 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 in the current environment today. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, we obviously we have to wait and see how that plays out, but yeah, it's, it's really very difficult. I mean, in 07, the US sneezed, right? So, and in 08, uh, I think Asia and EMs all uh, basic, basically got uh, very, very sick. Okay, so, yeah, there's something to think about. Um, actually, I'll just add that normally when you have good U.S. growth, it's actually also good for the world. It's good for EFs. So um, we, we don't see why would uh, U.S. growth be good and then EM growth would not be good because after all, the whole world is interconnected. Uh, U.S. is always the leader. If their growth is good, global growth is going to be good. So um, that's why we, we, we do have that slant towards the emerging markets. Of course, if Trump were to come up with his protectionist policies, then it wouldn't be good for Asia because Asia is very trade dependent. Um, so in our portfolios, what we do is um, depending, uh, you know, we, we, we are along Brazil. Uh, in, in some portfolios, we are even along Argentina. So we try to pick the countries that are, you know, will have less of that trade you know, influence on uh, if, if things go wrong. For example, we are also along uh, Indonesia, the Indian rupee, rupee um, uh, so, and, and Poland, Hungary. So these are some of these countries that, well, you'll, you'll still benefit from, from U.S. growth. Uh, thanks, Kevo. Uh, so I can add can... something. Um, whether Trump comes to power or whether Trump disrupts anything, there's three big things which are happening in the U.S. U.S. is becoming energy independent which means U.S. has their own oil and gas. And what does that mean? It's going to attract investments. We are really starting to see investments going into the U.S. That's number one. And number two, I think I spoke about the, fact, the factory automation and the robots. Like it or not, that is going to happen, and that is going to shift some of the globalization, global trade back to home or back to the U.S. Nothing to do with Trump. It's technology, it's oil and gas, and then maybe you have a bit of tax cuts from Trump and that's going to attract investments. So actually the US is looking very good with or without Trump. And I would say that Trump is very lucky to be coming in as a president at a very good time. Um, I think for those who follow astrology, I think people say his astrology is very good actually. <laughs> yeah. But jokes aside, whether Trump comes to power or not, the US is in a very different footing. And it has got oil, there's investments happening. The U.S. consumers are repaired after the global financial crisis, and then you've got factory and automation happening. We hear stories of Hong Hai and Sharp opening up a plant in the U.S. Who would have imagined that three years ago? Formosa Plastics opening up plant in the U.S., Hyundai building a plant. And just last week, we heard that he convinced Toyota to move the, factory, the plant, the 1.4 billion plant, from Mexico to the U.S. But you know, auto plant is all about robots. If you go into a Hyundai auto plant, you will see very few workers there. I mean, I've been to some auto plants there. Very few workers. It's not going to create lots of workers. There's some peripheral workers. But basically, it's technology. It's a bit of capex and capital investment incentives, which is going to drive things back to the U.S. So whether EM is a loser or not, I cannot answer that because we are looking at U.S. as an isolation. Of course, the trade costs can happen, but it's impossible to make your iPhone in the U.S. The supply chain sits in Taiwan, Korea, and Japan. So some things he can move, some things he can't move. I mean, it takes time. End of the day, he's a businessman. So he won't do very silly things, but the direction is there. But I think EM will have its own footing. It will have its own strengths. We have infrastructure, which has got a huge potential in this part of the world. We've got China building the one, one belt, one road infrastructure, and China's got a different agenda altogether. China's going to go around with lollipops to Philippines, to Malaysia, to us. And basically, China is going to influence a lot of things in this part of the world. So there's a lot of money coming in. There's a lot of things happening in this part of the world. Just that you need to remember that globalization has peaked already, right? This out outsourcing story that people used to talk about is global trade. It's, it's past us. I mean, US has six years of growth, and we never saw global trade pick up in a very big way. And you need to ask why, right? So there's onshoring happening in the US, and globalization is peaked. So this, this thing about, you know, EM getting affected by trade or getting affected by some of these things, we need to take it with a pinch of salt. 
Thanks, Alvin. Uh, okay, perhaps we will just take one more question. Yes. Um, okay, um, my question is on Trump and, and his impact. Uh, we know that um, he's talked about a lot of fiscal, uh, fiscal stimulus, right? That will have a direct impact on the debt ceiling, which every year is being negotiated. So what do you think about the impact of the debt ceiling because of its fiscal policy suspension? Um, then the other thing is that all this talk about uh, him forcing companies to relocate to or, or locate more in the U.S. would have an impact on the pricing of the goods that are sold by the U.S. What is the impact of inflation? Right, because you know, you're forcing high cost producers to produce more. Third thing is that, um, is there competitive devaluation happening now? Uh, we have seen the uh, renminbi go down, the Japanese yen go down, and the Malaysian ringgit goes down. Is there a risk of uh, competitive devaluation among the major uh, emerging economies that are main exporters? And the risk that may arise similar to the Asian financial crisis. I know you have shown charts, let's say, on the better current account surpluses uh, or balances in these countries. But if, let's say, I, I'm not sure of the data, if there is um, a lot of the debt still denominated in US dollar and US dollar goes up, right, there will be um, quite an impact on the debt crisis that may come. I would appreciate your comments. Thank you. It's just a pretty loaded question, yeah. Okay, uh, um, maybe I'll just answer one or two. Um, I think there were three. So the first one on Trump, um, the debt ceiling. Uh, yes, you are right. The debt ceiling keeps being revised um, year after year. Uh, so the big question is how much you know fiscal stimulus really is Trump going to come up with? The problem now is that the numbers are all over the place, so no one actually knows the real numbers. Of course, his initial numbers did sound quite ridiculous. If I didn't remember wrongly, um, it, it's probably going to. And in any case, the the stimulus would be dragged out over quite a number of years, so you won't suddenly see a lot of of debt being issued. Um, the other thing is that he is as well thinking of perhaps coming up with a border tax so as to you know, get more income to be able to fund um, all his uh, fiscal stimulus. So at this moment, I think um, he, his treasury is trying to, or the new treasury will try to think of different ways uh, to raise money uh, to, to build all the infrastructure that they will be building. Um, nonetheless, yes, the debt numbers should increase over the next couple of years. But I don't think they want to bust that either because they know that it, it is increasing. Um, the second question was on inflation, right? Uh, inflation... Um, sorry, what was the question again on inflation? I think he's, uh, the gentleman is asking if uh, the new policies that Trump is coming out with or rolling out with, whether that could lead to uh, a, rise in, a huge rise in inflation. Is that, is that what, I, what I get? Uh, yes, okay. that's that's right. So uh, basically, uh, we we will see inflation. And in fact, that's why inflation has picked up. Uh, inflation expectations are picking up as well. You are starting to see that, um, and and that is is, is the theme going forward for, for the next year or so. Um, because when you have uh, higher cost of goods, uh, you know, with either because of tax. Uh, but on the other hand, if you have a higher tax uh, and you're going to generate inflation and things like that, uh, what can happen is that the US dollar might depreciate because you are trying to, you know, the consumers have to counter it off, right? You, you, you need to depreciate your currency so that you, you can import the goods in cheaper as well. So it, it, it's, it's a difficult scenario to see what can really happen. But definitely for sure, if you just look at wages alone in the US, yes, there is inflation and it's uh, rising. Um, and I might just add, um, talk about the question that you had, the third one about the crisis. And I would say that Asian economies, and, and in my charts I did show about the, the current account balances that Asia is a much stronger footing. Um, I would also say that in, during the Asian financial crisis, 
um, the foreign exchange reserves was much, much weaker. So the central banks had no firepower to support their currencies, which is why they had to let them go and depay from the US dollars. And today, we've got 10 times as much foreign exchange reserves, so they have a much stronger buffer in order to try to um, defend their currencies if there is a crisis. Um, so that's one point. In terms of the debt that's denominated in US dollars, um, there are some countries that still have uh, sovereigns that have a high, higher amount of debt denominated in US dollars, and that would be in the larger economies, maybe Indonesia. But if you look at Singapore, um, even Malaysia, uh, they, they haven't been... Uh, Korea, well, Korea has some um, in, in terms of the quasi-sovereign space, but a lot of Asian sovereigns have not had to issue in dollars because they can issue in their own local markets, they can issue in their own currencies now. And why is that? It's because like country like Singapore, the fundamentals are so much stronger that they can go out and issue debt in Singapore dollars and they don't have to issue in dollars anymore. Um, so that, from that perspective, it, there, there is a factor for some countries um, and it this will really more affect the frontier, some of the frontier markets like Sri Lanka, Vietnam, you know, because their currency are weaker, they can't issue in dollars. So they have, they are forced to, they can't issue in their own currencies and they're forced to issue in dollars. So they're the countries probably um, that you would be more concerned with if there is a crisis. Um, but uh, overall, you know, I, I think to have a rerun of the Asian financial crisis is really not our base case scenario. We will be hit if there's a global event like the, Asia, like the global financial crisis, but I think as we all saw, Asia managed through that very, very well. And I think if it's a crisis that actually doesn't emanate from Asia, but from a more global point of view, I think Asia is much in a much stronger position today to be able to withstand such a crisis. Just on the currencies, I would say that <clears throat> in 2016, you saw the renminbi weaken about six to seven percent against the CFETs. The CFETs is a basket that the renminbi created. It's a trade-weighted basket. Um, so the renminbi did have a depreciation last year, and we think that this year we probably will see another 5 to 6% depreciation uh, in the renminbi. Um, I think Asian currencies will kind of follow suit, maybe 3 to 5% depreciation. And the reason is really because the US is in a very strong footing. And two things which are driving that, one is the monetary policies are diverging. The US is tightening, the rest of the world probably status quo. I think ECB is talking about tapering, but I think they're largely keeping the QE programs in place. So if you have that, then the divergent monetary policies is going to probably get the dollar to strengthen further. The other thing is the growth referential. I think the US GDP growth have been revised upwards. Um, like uh, one of the speakers said, we don't know what the, the, the size and the composition of the fiscal boost, but the directions are pointing upwards. When you look at the rest of the world, there's some recovery in some parts of the world, but the US is still looking like a very strong footing. So growth differential and monetary policy differentials are going to drive the dollar higher. The question then is, are we going to have a crisis? You need to remember there is a lot of US dollar debt in this part of the world. Uh, our research shows there's $3 trillion of US dollar debt in this part of the world, half of which are sitting with China. Well, I think, like one of the speakers said, the balance sheets are pretty okay and the FX reserves are pretty strong in this part of the world, so I think Asia will come out pretty well. But please remember, there is some controls which countries have started putting in. I mean, China has put in soft capital controls already. They've even controlled union pay, uh, uh, payment of insurance um, by union pay. I think last year in December, we saw Malaysia ringgit um, correcting quite, quite fast. And we tried to do some hedging, we tried to do some offshore stuff, but there were no quotes available for offshore, by offshore banks. It kind of shows that they've already started putting some, some capital controls or some sort of soft capital controls in place. So there is stress. And remember, like a country like Malaysia, half the, the bond market is owned by foreigners. So when they want to come out of the door, the door is pretty narrow. Um, but then again, we don't see that kind of scenario. We don't see a dollar shock. We just see a gradual appreciation of the dollar, maybe 5 6% and a gradual depreciation of the Asian currencies. So in that kind of a scenario, there's no panic, there's no big moves in the market. I think the crisis uh, will not be a, a main scenario. Uh, so we, we completely rule out that scenario. But if there's a shocking renminbi move, maybe more than 5, 6, 7, 8%, then probably we'll have some kind of stress in this part of the world because there's still US dollar debt in this part of the world. Thanks, Evan. Okay, we have come to the end of the panel discussion. Uh, please join me in a round of applause to thank the speakers and the panelists.
I'll hand the time over now to JP.